Welcome back. You can join this conversation because uh, Andy and I have uh, been rattling away for five minutes while you were away. Uh, Andy Dakin uh, works with Sheffield Wednesday's commercial department, having previously been commercial manager at Sheffield United, been in the business for approaching 35 years, including spells at uh, Barnsley and at Hull as mm -hmm. well. Um, we're going to talk about some of the innovations you've been involved in, in, in your role at the, at the two football clubs. But Hull uh, begs a question. Because that was quite a sticky wicket, to use a summer analogy, wasn't it? It was. I'd, I'd left Sheffield United and, um, funny enough, I was going to go and work um, for SIV. Sheffield uh, uh, Yeah, Sheffield, Sheffield International Venues. Yeah. And um, I, I was appro approached by your old boss, um, Bill McDonald. Bill McDonald. Would I would I consider it? And so. Uh, Bill um, McDonald, former managing director of Radio Hallam, lovely yeah. guy. Mm. Uh, I great, hope he's well. Great gentleman. Well. Yeah. 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 Great gentleman. And um, so I actually said yes, I'll go and work for Chef International Venues, and then get, I got a call off Richard Ibbotson. I don't know if you know. Yes, him, I know Richard. Richard but, yeah. um, would I consider going to Hull? There's a yeah. few of us locally getting involved, and one very colourful. Character, as I'm sure you know, yeah. um, and so the law of going straight back into football um, just was too great, and I went went to Hull. And this was Stephen Hinchliffe, was the mm -hmm. colourful character. Mm -hmm. And uh, we won't go into all the details, but where did this end up? Well, it, it, they did very well because when I joined Hull City, they were nine points clear at the bottom of the fourth division, right. at the very bottom. Yeah. And uh, so it looked like doom and gloom, as in relegation. They brought a couple of players in, um, did very well, and survived somehow that season. In fact, at, at the Easter game, we played Scarborough. Don't, I don't think Neil Warnock was there at the time. He no. might have been, but I don't think he was. No, he wasn't. He was at Bury. And, um, and we had a crowd of about 13,000 with a capacity of something like 8,000. <laughs> got into a lot of trouble for that but the I think the directors of which I was one at that time they felt that well this is easy we just need to win a few games and we get these bumper yeah. crowds we'll bring in big money and and of course it wasn't like that and no. and so the following year they spent too much money um, got themselves into financial difficulties and the writing was on the wall really mm. and um, I suppose it would be the end of the Mid, no, the middle of the following season, um, they decided it was time that they had to put the club into administration. Yeah, it was an unhappy time. It was a very unhappy yeah. time, and um, we, every director, ended up getting arrested. My arrest was um, something like probably six or eight months afterwards, by which time I'd been to Barnsley and was back yeah. at Sheffield United. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, what the reason for it was, I'll, I'll never, never know. But, but it, was, it was very hard because, um, because I was pretty well known in Sheffield. When, it, when I, I rang Martin Ross of HR Media, who was looking after Sheffield yeah. United at the time, and I said, look, Martin, I, I've got to be arrested by appointment. <laughs> but, um, but nevertheless, I'm going to be arrested. I think this could hit the newspapers. You know, just need yeah. to be aware of it. And he said, oh, no, don't worry, it's, it's Donnergate at the moment. That's all they're bothered about. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, the entire front page of the star was my picture with a <laughs> pint of beer in my hand like I was having a good time. Um, yeah. And your kids have to go to school the next day. Yeah. And you know, it's your dad's a thief and he's stolen money from Sheffield United to take to Hull or he's stolen money from Hull to, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. And, and they made up all sorts of things. But, it, but in fact, when we, when we went to, to the... Uh, to the police station, the questions were about knowingly trading whilst insolvent, and and the DTI weren't interested in the slightest. So, a charge was never ever made, and I, and I don't think that's a fair thing to do to people no, to publicise it so greatly when you know you've done nothing wrong, you've never been yes. charged with anything. This has become yet, an issue quite a lot recently with public figures, hasn't yeah, it? Yes, it's, it's the mud it's, sticks. Absolutely, the damage is done, no, yeah. no matter what. And I can remember having a rather serious argument with the then editor of the Star, Peter Charlton, at a, at a social event at, at Baldwin's, um, and, uh, you know, nearly coming to blows and saying, well, you know, 
I hope that you will put it on the front page when it's when it's known that there's there's no case to answer. Could they? Which they did. To, right. to his credit, they was, did. The headline they did wasn't do as that, big. But no. But no the headline wasn't as no. big, but it, it was there. Yeah. But again, presumably, it, the, the information was leaked to the star. Absolutely. Uh, from yeah. one yeah. one can only guess. From the police, we, we imagine. Well, I don't I, know. I, don't know. I, I can remember being at Barnsley with um, Dave Kilner, God bless him, yeah. uh, and uh, watching a game at Barnsley, and um, and he and he said, you know, this, "It's it's hit hit the news. I know about it." So, you know, it, it was going to get in the it papers. died because enough pe people know you, and enough people know you're a good guy. In the, in yeah, the I hope so, yeah. Plenty of people yeah. do. Now, apart from what's happened on the field, and obviously you'll have taken pleasure in a couple of promotions, I mean, Ian Porterfield got the club up uh, two divisions mm -hmm. when you first joined, mm -hmm. obviously the Dave Bassett years as well, mm -hmm. and y y you've enjoyed Sheffield Wednesday's um, recent revival. Yes. But what about things outside of the football in terms of your marketing roles that have given you the most satisfaction? Oh gosh! Um, firstly, going back to to the Dave Bassett's and the Ian Porterfields, I mean it, it, that is that is what has, has kept me in football all these years, meeting such fantastic people in the game that you can actually develop a, a relationship with and call them a friend. And you know, I still speak to Harry as we all call him on a regular basis, and um, and you do bump into people yeah. all over the place. So it, that's fabulous. Um, in terms of the things I've done, probably in my earlier years at, at Bramall Lane that gave me a great deal of satisfaction were, were things like the Bruce Springsteen concert, the, the Bomber Graham fight at, at Bramall Lane, putting on Mission England, I mean, having, um, gosh, I've forgotten his name now. Billy Graham. Billy that Graham, was Dr. Billy Billy Graham. Graham. Billy Graham yeah. of course. And yeah. in fact, he gave Linda and I a, a signed Bible. Um, we were just about to get married at the end of that. that was, so that would be 1985. Right. But but events like that, and you know, the, the chairman at that time, who was who was who was fantastic to me, um, brought me into the game and 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 let me nourish in the business side of, of football. And Reg uh, Brealey. Reg Brealey, yeah, he he was lovely guy. He, he was a fantastic and much maligned at times, especially okay. in his second period involved with the club. Mm. Um, very much maligned, but um, but he he wants to look. We're going to have to raise some money and come up with some ideas. Anyway, we launched this thing, and it was called the Blades Revival. I don't know if you remember. I do it. remember it. Yes. But um, yeah. we, what we did, we put a we put an article in the Star and the Green, and saying, if you care about the future of Sheffield United, come to top rank mm. on whatever night it was. I can't remember, but. So, top rank got filled like you've never seen, and it was there was over three thousand people in there. Had the police and fire having to keep people out from outside. More than for bingo, even. Absolutely, and and at the end of the day, this was just so I could say to everybody, all pay two pounds a week in to this scheme, yeah. and you'll help raise funds. And the chairman said, look, I'll keep the club going, but we need yeah. money for new players. And we raised very quickly, and, and you know, I'm talking what 80s, early mid 80s, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I think Billy McCune was at the manager at the time. Right. And um, we raised 120 thousand pounds, and brought and bought a striker whose name I f also forget now. Yeah. Um, Gosh, can't remember his name. Well, that but seems it, to it indicate didn't, it didn't that do the, very well. No, it seems to indicate <laughs> the money didn't quite no. go. To, that was a lot no. of money then as well. It was it? a lot of money. Yeah, hundred and twenty thousand. Yeah. Hey, he was a big striker from Leicester, wasn't no, he? No, 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 no that's no, Alan Young. Not, Alan Young, was no, not no. him. No, no, he was a small. He uh, was a black lad. Alan Young was before um, that. Richard Cadet. Richard Cadet. Richard Cadet. Richard Cadet. Richard Cadet. Yeah, we yeah. thought he, he never really. Not quite. No. Never really made it. So that was disappointing. Had he have gone on to do great things. But we also, I, I remember, um, we had Glyn Hodges, yeah. and uh, we took Glyn Hodges on, on loan originally. And so we then did a, a, another scheme, which was, well, we want to sign Glyn, but we need to raise some money to do so. Right. And we ran what effectively was a raffle, sent out tickets to everybody all over the city saying, sell these tickets, and it, and it raised about 80,000 pounds. 
So this is the innovative side. You're not just working with companies wanting sponsorship. You're actually trying to create revenue for the football club. And you did that with that, the, the boxing match. I remember all mm -hmm. of these things were quite new in those days, weren't Absolutely, they? Absolutely. Yeah. Pop concert, Bruce mm -hmm. Springsteen. Yeah. That was fantastically attended. Uh, and I think you, if, you, if you listen out, you can still hear the echoes to, today yeah. from that. that. I mean, that was a fabulous experience. And, and Harry Bassett had just started at Bramall Lane that, in probably the February of that year. Yeah. And uh, I made one massive, massive mistake, which was the pitch and it got absolutely ruined. And the reason it got ruined is because when you open the gates and you've got 40,000 people coming, there were 44,000 two nights running right. in Bramall Lane. And um, they all rush to the front. Once they get to the front, they're not gonna move. No. So what they do when they need to yes. go to the loo, they don't move, they go on the spot. Right. So, of course, so didn't your eye yeah. got into, yeah. <laughs> into the grass and, and yeah. burnt it and killed it. Is that what happened? Killed exactly it completely. Yeah. And um, I, was, I was then later talking to the, to the secretary of um, Man City, yeah. who had put a few concerts on at, at Main Road, it was in those days, yeah. of course. And he said, oh, well, did you not know that you can put an antidote onto your <laughs> grass beforehand <laughs> that will stop that burning happening. You can but treat it and then, said, and then invite people to... Yeah. Uh, thanks thanks to for telling me now, but the, the, the damage was done. And, yeah. the, and, the, and the council, in their wisdom, uh, Don Valley was just being built, mm. and they declared Bramall Lane a, a noise abatement zone. <laughs> So that was the end of pop concerts, really. That's a pretty for, Well, they, they clearly knew they wanted to put concerts on at, at Don Valley, and that was understandable, yeah. really. And it probably was a better venue. Yeah, yeah. For pop concerts. You've never quite seen that at Hills, uh, those kind of innovations at Hillsborough over the years. Well, there, there was rugby league there. I remember Sheffield Eagles play, uh, played there. I'm trying to think of other things, but they've used they've used the ground for Jehovah's Witnesses conventions. And, they did for many uh, years, yeah. From, you know, and 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 obviously the offices and suites. How has football changed in terms of? the money side driving it. I mean, you've been involved in the money side, the revenue earning side all the way. Is that now more important in football than it was, and more important perhaps than it should be? I think probably television is, is more important than it was. I mean, you'll remember in the 80s, um, th th there was a period with no televised football yeah. because the Football League, as it was in those days, couldn't agree terms with BBC, so there was no match of the day, absolutely nothing. And fortunately, videos had just come on board. Yeah. So VHS and Betamax videos yeah. were produced of every game. In, in fact, um, the guy, uh, the lead singer of Def Leppard, Joe Elliott, yeah. I used to send a video out to him wherever he was in right. the world right. every week. Yeah. You know, and, and that was the way people kept in, in touch. But, you know, cometh the Premier League, cometh Sky Television, and, yeah. and that's what's really changed the world. And that's where the, that's where the serious money comes from now. Mm. You know, we, we all would tell, tell everybody it was £173 million mm. if you win that game at, at Wembley the other yeah. week. Yeah. Um, and, and that's because of television. It is. So uh, How much... It, easier has it been to sell or become to sell Sheffield Wednesday to sponsors, backers, commercial partners or what, whatever as a result of what people have seen on the field? In this last year, the success yes. that we've had. I can't say it's been any easier because the, the, the pricing's been tight or mm. expensive, shall we say. But um, so I don't think it's, it's been any easier. People do want to see good football and the previous year Mm. They clearly hadn't experienced mm. good football in it. What did we win? Three or four games at home almost, right. and but it was just scored hardly any goals. Success was standing was, still, wasn't it? Yeah, and 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 Stuart Gray did a he fabulous did. job with limited resources, yeah. and and what a lovely guy he was as well. Yeah, um, but um, but you know, success is what people want to see, and they will mm. pay. You know, it was, it was abundantly clear when we played Arsenal mm. in the League Cup. And, and it was a sellout.
pricing is such a delicate thing, isn't it? Just getting that right. And again, Mr. Shansiri, a quick learner. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever mistakes it seems to me that he's made, and he has made some, he's been very quick to correct or to tweak or, for instance, the pricing, then people hit the roof over the match day prices. He's been quick to react. And towards the end of the season, it seemed he discovered how to fill that stadium. 20 quid. Well, yeah, yeah that, that, that clearly helps. Um, the, um, the games at the end of the season get bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. And, and, of course, pe people's aspirations to attend those games grow. But, but it is a price-sensitive yeah. business. There's no question about that. Um, and, and, and just how far you can go with prices. He, you know, he's trying to bring as much revenue into the club as yeah. he possibly can. Because he's spending a lot. That's, because that's he's spending fair. a yeah. considerable sum of money. Um, yeah. But it, it's, a, it's a tight line that you, you, yeah. you cross, really. So um, but you, he, you've got to have good football to, to go for those top prices. He didn't know football and he didn't know the city. And he's learned an awful lot in that, that first year. I'm sure. About both, I think. Mm. And has proved a quick learner. He has indeed, yeah. He, yeah. He, he, it's difficult when it's a different culture as well. And, um, you know, understanding that, that we have had a year of, not rubbish, but it, it wasn't a great season. The Mediocrity. Year. Mediocrity. And, um, uh, and this season's been a steady growth, actually. We didn't start off that well no. at the beginning of the season, but it, it has developed throughout the year and been, been a tremendous season. Yeah. Do you notice any difference between the nature of Blades and Owls, temperamentally? Uh, whether it's a myth or not, there is a theory that Wednesdayites have always got the glass half full and that Blades have got it half empty. Is there any, is there any truth in that? I mean, Wednesday, Wednesdayites have backed their team through mm -hmm. some pretty bleak years and remained optimistic. Uh, with some justification, Unitedites have been driven to distraction. Six years in League One is an awful long time. Yeah. So is there, any, is there any intrinsic difference between the two, do you think? Uh, I've absolutely no idea on that from Alan, but you know, I think, I think Sheffield United have done pretty well to maintain attendances in the 18 to 20,000 yeah. region after a, a lengthy spell in, in League One. You know, the, they were pipped by, by Sheffield Wednesday. Um, what, what, three years ago was it now? Yes. Um, you know, and that must have hurt. Yeah. Um, but, the, but they've kept going. And I, I don't think there's any difference. We're Sheffield people, aren't we? Yeah. I don't, I don't see any difference between you know, Chris United Martin, and... You don't see any difference between the nature no. of the two. No. A blade is, back, is in charge mm -hmm. uh, of Sheffield United. Yeah. Chris Wilder, you'll know him well. I know Chris very, very well. In fact, um, I remember talking to him on John Street side of the, the old John Street as was when he made his debut um, as a, I don't know how old he was, but probably only 17. Mm -hmm. He was a kid mm -hmm. when he made his debut and I remember talking to him after the game in what was the old director's room on, on John Street and, um, and, and became friends. I like to think we're still friends. I saw him down at um, the League Managers Association awards dinner and had a chat with him there when he just joined. Jeff United, it's, I think he'll be fabulous. Mm. Chris Wilder, by the way, is our guest, our special guest, in the studio next week. So, Blades fans, I, I said I owed you big time over the previous weeks with the mm. Wednesday coverage. I like to repay my debts, and uh, Chris uh, will be here uh, next, next week. Don't miss that. Two great stories to finish with. Mm. I know they're great stories. Uh, people watching may not have heard these. Uh, first of all, your single playing appearance, I, I believe, for Sheffield United was on a tour of Jersey. It was, Jer yeah, Jersey and Guernsey, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was, it, it happened perfect timing, actually, because um, the, that would have been in 86, and um, we were preparing for the, the um, centenary of Sheffield United for 89. And, and producing a book, so so I was able to get my name in that book as as, <laughs> as having been a player on the players list. Um, but it was it was a, it was an official fixture. Uh, albeit and that's an, the only reason you an played. An international friendly. No, the reason I played, and I, the 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 players pr probably wouldn't want to be mentioned, but we were in um, 
I think we were actually in Guernsey at the time, but, but um, as players will do on, on end of season tours, had a few drinks and um, the cards had come out and I think, I think one or two had got a bit stroppy and, right. and a, a brawl erupted, which, okay. which meant a, two or three players ended up in hospital, would you believe? <laughs> and so that gave me uh, a chance and Billy McEwen had just taken over as... Um, um, I think he was actually acting manager. Yeah. He wasn't appointed manager. Right. Porterfield had gone. Um, and Billy said to me, look, you can be on the bench. We're going to be short tomorrow. That must have been a thrill. So, um, so, and I'd trained I, with him. I was, I, I'd have been 31 or 32. You got on? But I got, yeah, he brought me on. Did he offer a contract? He gave me a game for half an hour. I, I actually played centre-back with Paul Did Stancliffe. You? And John Burridge decided to come out with goal and go up front and scored. Yeah, um, I think we won about eight nil. But um, but played. it was fabulous. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a fabulous experience. Yeah, you can say you played for Sheffield United. I can indeed. Yeah. Now a Wednesday story. There mm -hmm. was searching. The situation is it's just a few years ago now. Searching for a shirt sponsor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary Scotting. Is oh, the yeah. businessman involved? Just mm -hmm. Cues you up. Well, when I yeah when when I went and joined. Um, Sheffield Wednesday, Paul Aldridge had said to me, look, don't worry, at least we've got a shirt sponsor lined up, but the shirt sponsor fell through. And so we had to work very quickly to try and get a shirt sponsor organised for the, for the coming season. And so I, I sort of thought, who do I know in Sheffield that is capable of doing this at short notice? And Gary Scotting, who then owned um, the Gilda Group, and is still involved, but but on, uh, on a small scale because he sold out to JCT 600. Um, but I, I said to Gary, Gary had said to me, look, if ever I do sponsorship, I'm going to do both clubs. Right. Because I don't want to upset anybody. I'm yeah. a Sheffield person. Um, he, he is a Sheffield Wednesday fan, but didn't want to upset anybody. So I, I went to Gary and I went to Westfield Health yeah. to, to Graham Moore and said, look, what about doing something different and putting both right. both of you on, on both shirts. One minute and 30 seconds. Okay, I'll be very quick. <laughs> so, so, um, so I said to Paul Aldridge, I've got Gary Scotting involved, really, you know, it's going to be good this. No, we don't want Gary. He'd gone on the radio saying he was going to put a consortium together to buy the club. We don't want foreigners and southerners running this football club. Right. So, to be very quick, I had to hurriedly organise a, a meeting at my because house. Because you've got a foreigner, Melan yeah, Mandrich yeah. as chairman and owner, and, and a, a southern, southerner. southerner as vice chairman. Yeah. And, uh, and so I got Gary, uh, Milan Mandrich and Paul round to my house and and let them fight it out, which which lasted about 15 seconds. <laughs> and uh, and they became great friends and, and Gary did go on to sponsor the club, which was, which was great. People say these things, don't they? And then face to face, it's somewhat different. Absolutely, isn't it? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he said, "Well, it was a misinterpretation, blah blah, blah yeah. all those things." But, but yeah, and Gary's a great guy, and 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 really bailed the club out when we needed support. It was fantastic. And it's been absolute pleasure chatting to you. I, I owe you a debt as well because when I started my freelance career in. Uh, 1984, uh, Andy helped me out. He, among his many duties, was uh, editing and producing the Sheffield United program, mm -hmm. and I ended up with a with a column in that. So thank you, you for did, that, yeah. and mm -hmm. for keeping in touch for all these years, and for all the memories and all the stories. It's been brilliant chatting, Andy Dakin. I'm sure you've enjoyed that. If you've missed it, it's a repeat at 11 p.m. Or you can catch up with it on my YouTube channel. It's been do downloaded on there. See you next week with Chris Wilder. Bye. But it was. It was very hard because um, because I was pretty well known in Sheffield. When it when I, I rang Martin Ross of HR Media, who was looking after Sheffield yeah. United at the time, and I said, "Look, Martin, I, I've got to be arrested by appointment, <laughs> but um, but nevertheless, I'm going to be arrested. I think this could hit the newspapers. You know, just need mm. to be aware of it." And he said, "Oh no, don't worry. It's it's Donnergate at the moment. That's all they're bothered about." And, and of course, the entire front page of the star was my picture with a <laughs> pint of beer in my hand, like I was having a good time. Um, yeah. And your kids have to go to school the next day. Yeah. And you know, it's your dad's a thief, and he's stolen money from Sheffield United to take to Hull, or he's stolen money from Hull to, you know, whatever it is. And, and they made up all sorts of things. But it, but in fact, when we when we went to to the uh, to the police station, the questions were about knowingly trading whilst insolvent. 
and, and the DTI weren't interested in the slightest. So a charge was never ever made and I, and I don't think that's a fair thing to do to people no, to publicise it so greatly when you know, you've done nothing wrong, you've never been charged with anything. This has become yet. an issue quite a lot recently with public figures, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's... The it's mud sticks. Absolutely. The damage is done, no, yeah. no matter what. And I can remember having a rather serious argument with the then editor of the Star, Peter Charlton, at a, at a social event at, at Baldwin's, um, and, uh, you know, nearly coming to blows and saying, well, you know, I hope that you will put it on the front page when it's when it's known that there's, there's no case to answer. Did they? Which they did. To, right. to his credit, they was, did The headline did wasn't do as that, big. But no. But no, no. The headline wasn't no. as big, but it, it was there. Yeah. But Hinchliffe was the mm -hmm. colourful character. Mm -hmm. And uh, we won't go into all the details, but where did this end up? Well, it, it, they did very well, because when I joined Hull City, there were nine points clear at the bottom of the fourth division, right. at the very bottom. Yeah. And uh, so it looked like doom and gloom, as in relegation. They brought a couple of players in, um, did very well, and survived somehow that season. In fact, at, at the Easter game, we played Scarborough. Don't, I don't think Neil Warnock was there at the time. He right. might have been, but I don't think he was. No, he wasn't. He was at Bury. And, um, and we had a crowd of about 13,000 with a capacity of something like 8,000. <laughs> yeah got into a lot of trouble for that but the I think the directors of which I was one at that time they felt that well this is easy we just need to win a few games and we get these bumper yeah. crowds we'll bring in big money and and of course it wasn't like that and no. and so the following year they spent too much money um, got themselves into financial difficulties and the writing was on the wall really mm. and um, I suppose it would be the end of the Mid, no, the middle of the following season, um, they decided it was time that they had to put the club into administration. Yeah, it was an unhappy time. It was a very unhappy yeah. time, and um, we every director ended up getting arrested. My arrest was um, something like probably six or eight months afterwards. By which time I'd been to Basel and was back yeah. at Sheffield United. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, what the reason for it was, I'll, I'll never, never know, but... Welcome back. You can join this conversation because uh, Andy and I have been rattling away for five minutes while you were away. Uh, Andy Dakin uh, works with Sheffield Wednesday's commercial department, having previously been commercial manager at Sheffield United, been in the business for approaching 35 years, including spells at uh, Barnsley and at Hull as mm -hmm. well. Um, we're going to talk about some of the innovations you've been involved in, in, in your role at the, t the two football clubs. But Hull uh, begs a question. Because that was quite a sticky wicket, to use a summer analogy, wasn't it? It was. I'd, I'd left Sheffield United and, um, funny enough, I, I was going to go and work um, for SIV. Sheffield? Uh, uh, yeah, Sheffield International uh, Venues. Yeah. And um, I, I was appro approached by your old boss. Um, Bill McDonald. Bill McDonald. Would I would I consider it? And so. Uh, Bill McDonald, former managing director of Radio Hallam, lovely yeah. guy. Mm. Uh, I great, hope he's well. Great gentleman. Well. Yeah. 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 Great gentleman. And um, so I actually said yes, I'll go and work for Chef International Venues, and then get, I got a call off Richard Ibbotson. I don't know if you know. Yes, him. I know Richard. Richard but, yeah. um, would I consider going to Hull? There's a yeah. few of us locally getting involved, and one very colourful character as I'm sure you know yeah. um, and so the law of going straight back into football um, just was too great and I went went to Hull and this was Steve Graham, Billy, Billy Graham, Graham. Billy yeah. Graham of course and yeah. in fact he gave Linda and I a, a signed Bible um, we were just about to get married at the end of that, that was, so that would be 1985 right. but but events like that and you know the, the chairman at that time who was who was who was fantastic to me um, brought me into the game and, and, and let me nourish in the business side of, of football. 
and Reg Brealey. Reg Brealey, yeah. He, he was lovely guy. He, he was a fantastic, and much maligned at times, especially in his second period involved with the club. Mm. Um, very much maligned, but um, but he he wants to look. We're going to have to raise some money and come up with some ideas. Anyway, we launched this thing, and it was called the Blades Revival. I don't know if you remember. I do it. remember it. Yes. But um, yeah. we, what we did, we put a we put an article in the Star and the Green and saying, if you care about the future of Sheffield United, come to top rank mm. on whatever night it was. I can't remember. But so top rank got filled like you've never seen, and it was there was over three thousand people in there had the police and fire having to keep people out from outside. More than for bingo, even. Absolutely. And, and at the end of the day, this was just so I could say to everybody, all pay two pounds a week in to this scheme yeah. and you'll help raise funds. And the chairman said, look, I'll keep the club going, but we need yeah. money for new players. And we raised very quickly, and, and you know, I'm talking what, 80, early, mid 80s, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I think Billy McCune was at the manager at the time. Right. And uh, but again, presumably, it, the, the information was leaked to the star. Absolutely. Uh, from yeah. one yeah. I can only guess, from the police, we, we imagine. Well, I, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I can remember being at Barnsley with um, Dave Kilner, God bless him, yeah. uh, and uh, watching a game at Barnsley. And, um, and, he, and he said, you know, this, it's, it's hit, hit the news, I know about it. So. You know, it, it was going to get in the It papers. died because enough pe people know you and enough people know you're a good guy. In the, in yeah, the I hope so, yeah. Plenty of people yeah. do. Now, apart from what's happened on the field, and obviously you'll have taken pleasure in a couple of promotions. I mean, Ian Porterfield got the club up uh, two divisions mm -hmm. when you first joined, obviously mm -hmm. the Dave Bassett years as well. Mm -hmm. And y you've enjoyed Sheffield Wednesday's um, recent revival. Yes. But what about things outside of the football in terms of your marketing roles that have given you the most satisfaction? Oh gosh, um, firstly going back to, to the Dave Bassett's and the Ian Porterfields, I mean it, it, that, is, that is what has, has kept me in football all these years, meeting such fantastic people in the game that you can actually develop a, a relationship with and call them a friend and you know I still speak to Harry as we all call him on a regular basis and um, and you do bump into people yeah. all over the place so it, that's fabulous. Um, in terms of the things I've done probably in my earlier years at, at Bramall Lane that gave me a great deal of satisfaction were, were things like the Bruce Springsteen concert, the, the Bomber Graham fight at, at Bramall Lane, putting on Mission England, I mean, having um, Gosh, I've forgotten his name now. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. 